introduction, and I am glad to see several by now familiar faces and uh, uh, people who are becoming familiar in this, in this audience. Thank you for coming. Uh, for the sake of any who have joined us midstream, let me begin by reminding you of the thesis, the basic thesis that I'm seeking to develop in these lectures. And uh, I want to indicate where I am in the process of attempting to substantiate that thesis. I believe that the phase of the Christian movement which we call Christendom, that is the domination of official Christianity in the Western world, that this phase is coming and indeed has come to an effective end despite vestiges of Christendom that continue today and may continue for a very long time. It's as if the mechanism of the clock had stopped even though the pendulum still swings back and forward on its own momentum. I developed this part of the argument in the first lecture, which I called the decline and fall of Christendom. I also find that uh, the Christian churches or denominations are resisting this ending mightily, mostly by repressing their actual awareness of it, and in the second lecture, I explained that part of the reason why it is possible to do this in the North American situation, namely that our kind of establishment on this continent has been a cultural rather than a legal establishment. That is, it's been an identification of Christianity with general social values and mores of the dominant classes of the society. This has meant that Christianity has been able to seem viable as the majority faith in North America much longer than in the older legal established uh, situations in European church contexts. <clears throat> in this third lecture, I want to claim that appearances to the contrary we North American churches are now being visibly pushed to the periphery. And the question that is, is, is confronting us in this situation is, are we just going to let this happen to us, or can we give some concrete direction to this process of disestablishment? Can we make this process work for good? Now, not because I'm an optimist, but because I believe in God, I believe that we can. We can, in some meaningful sense, disestablish ourselves and, in the process, recover something of our genuine mission in the world. And then in the final lecture tomorrow evening, I shall characterize that genuine mission as the mission of a prophetic minority, salt, yeast, and light, distinct from the social milieu of which it is part, and yet assuming a new kind of responsibility for its host society and for the evolving of God's good earth. The first subtitle tonight is The Reality of Our Disestablishment. The Reality of Our Disestablishment. And I uh, engage in this partly because after the first lecture, somebody said, please quote me chapter and verse about the, you know, the actual statistics of our disestablishment. So this, I hope, will answer partly at least that question. <coughs> Despite the tenacity of our North American form of Christian establishment, a process of disestablishment has been underway in the United States and Canada for some time, at least since the end of World War II, it has been visible. 
Hence, the effective distancing from the dominant culture is occurring quite apart from any determination on the part of the church bodies concerned. We are no longer really mainline churches or major denominations in anything but the historical sense of having grown out of older families of Christendom. We are not mainstream churches, if that term implies, as it seems to imply for most people, a certain social status, a status of unquestionable social res respectability, a status of right-thinking American and Canadian Christianity, a status of being accepted as the official unofficial cults of our do dominant culture. I think we may be allowed to play that role here and there, but I also think that we are deluded if we imagine that it's, it's a part that our society reserves for us alone, or that it will simply be held open for us, world without end. I don't claim that we are socially insignificant. No, not at all. In fact, I believe that we have a greater potentiality for genuine public significance now than we have actually had in the past. But for the moment, my point is only that most of the denominations that formerly could claim for themselves such distinctions as mainline and mainstream or major denominations and all these other grandiose things are undergoing a shift to the periphery. This shift is partly, but only partly, made conspicuous at the quantitative level. According to the recent study, Christianity, a Social and Cultural History, edited by Howard Clark Key, and I quote, most of the denominations that dominated America's religious life before the Civil War, in brackets, Congregationalists, Episcopalians, Presbyterians and Methodists are in decline, unquote. <laughs> Between the years 1940 and 1986, this study goes on, there was an increase in the population of the United States from 130 millions to 240 millions, a rise of 83 percent. And I quote again, denominations defined by their European origins, for example, Lutherans and Mennonites, have grown at rates roughly comparable to the rise of population. Most of the older Protestant denominations have had rates of growth considerably below the rise in population, and some of the mainline denominations actually lost membership in the 1970s and 1980s. End of the quote. The American ecclesiastical situation, quantitatively speaking, is of course more impressive, if one wants to think in those terms, than that of Europe. But it would be naive to imagine that North America will continue to differ markedly from Europe in this respect in the century that lies ahead. According to the 1982 edition of the exhaustive World Christian Encyclopedia, an Oxford University Press publication edited by David Barrett. According to the 1982 edition of the World Christian Encyclopedia, and I quote, white Westerners cease to be practicing Christians at a rate of 7,600 per day. Unquote. John Taylor, in an essay entitled The Future of Christianity in the recently published Oxford Illustrated History of Christianity remarks, and I quote, there is no society more saturated with Christian influence, yet the main thrust of that steep rise in the number of people in the world who are without religion has occurred not under anti-religious despotism, but in Western Europe." Unquote. Hans Kuhn's one-sentence summary of the global situation seems to me generally accurate. He writes, I quote, 
of the three billion inhabitants of the earth, only about 950 millions are officially Christian, and only a fraction of those take any practical part in the church." Unquote. Now, while statistics are not to be scoffed at by Christian thinkers, they do not, however, tell the whole story. The effective disestablishment of Christianity in its traditional Western form is experienced by all of us at levels of recognition which go deeper than our knowledge of church membership roles, finances, and other, other readily quantifiable data of that type. If we've lived in North America for 50 or 60 years, as I have, then unless we are amongst the exceptions, we have witnessed the advent of public attitudes towards religion that are vastly different from those which were prevalent in our teens and twenties. Not only have we seen the rapid growth of an almost complete religionlessness on the part of many of our contemporaries, not only have we observed the erection in our towns and cities of temples, mosques, and pavilions of faiths known to us formerly, if they were known at all, only out of the storybooks of our youth, not only have we lived to see the proliferation of Christian sects and uh, what is more unnerving to us, their elevation to high social respectability, and even in the public mind to the status of normative Christianity, not only have we observed accordingly how the instinct to belief, if there is such an instinct, may now satisfy itself in literally thousands of ways that have little or nothing to do with Christianity that we took to gra for granted, say, in 1948. But beyond all that, the discriminating amongst us have discerned the appearance of new attitudes towards the whole phenomenon of religious belief. That it is strictly an option, that it is a purely individual decision, that there's no reason why the children of believing parents should be considered potential members of religious communions, that religion may be useful, but the truth does not necessarily apply to this category, and so on and so on. Attitudinal changes. Such uh, non-quantifiable experiences as these, and not only the statistics, were undoubtedly in the mind of the American church historian Robert T. Handy, incidentally a Baptist and one of my teachers, when in the final chapter of his 1977 book, A History of the Churches in the United States and Canada, he wrote, and I quote, the American and Canadian churches entered the period following World War I, devoted as they'd always sought to be to the services of God and to the continuation of the patterns of Western Christendom. In the half century following World War I, increasing numbers of persons, both inside and outside the churches, came to believe that their civilization was no longer basically Christian and that Christendom was a fading reality. Robert T. Handy, in his 1977 book, A History of the Churches in the United States and Canada. Now the question with which such observations as these leave us is not whether we can or cannot continue to assume the supposed privileges of our historical form of establishment. Rather, the question is, as I said, whether we shall simply allow the process of being disestablished to happen to us, or whether as individuals and Christian bodies, we shall take some active part in directing this process. The process itself, I believe, cannot be reversed. Moreover, I do not believe that Christ's discipleship is well served by trying to reverse it.
the scramble to regain or retain or retrieve or recreate Christendom, which is entertained in various forms and programs by several powerful Christian lobbies in North America and beyond, seems to me both socially naive and theologically questionable, even if it could be achieved. And it could not be achieved without violence, psychological if not physical violence. It would not represent to me a faithful re rendering of gospel for our context. Those of us who do not entertain the idea of re-Christianizing the West, uh, sorry, that was a mistake. Those of us who do entertain the idea of re-Christianizing the West, I'm not one of them, would do well to consider more carefully the millennium and a half, the 1500 years, during which Christ the Christian religion did dominate Europe and its satellites. Church historians who have tended during our own time to be academicians distanced from the pursuits of institutional churches have a particularly important role to play in ecclesiastical life today. Whatever else this study of history may mean, it entails the pursuit of truth about the past, and therefore it functions critically in relation to the tendency of institutions to indulge in one-sided and romantic versions of their own historical foundations. A church history sensing its responsibility for the church in our context, a context in which there is a temptation to attempt to recover Christendom's allegedly glorious past, a church history that is responsible to the churches today is obliged, it seems to me, to keep before the churches the memory of what it was necessary for Christianity to do and to become in order to achieve that state of preeminence that we call Christendom. In particular, such historians would be required to study and communicate in detail the history of Christian attitudes towards and treatment of alternative faiths and minorities of every kind. In particular, whoever thinks that Jesus Christ commands his body to convert everyone to an explicitly Christian faith had better contemplate the long, sad, and often gruesome story of Christian anti-Judaism ending up in Auschwitz. Whoever wants to believe that Christian mission means Christian expansion had better reconsider the terrible devastations wrought in the Americas by Europe's various Christian conquerors, conquistadors, if then we find ourselves amongst those who neither can pretend that nothing has changed, nor ignore the whole situation, nor seek to reconstitute the Humpty Dumpty that was Christendom, and if at the same time we are not content simply to allow the process of disestablishment to happen to us, then the only alternative that remains, it seems to me, is to accept the reality of our new situation, to look for the positive possibilities that it presents for us, and to seek to give meaningful direction to what historical providence appears to have in store for us. We could, of course, simply fall into despair. Many have already opted for that choice. We probably, all of us, know people who have opted for that choice, who find the decline of Christendom so despondent that they don't know what to do. Quietly, they just leave. One can understand this kind of discouragement, but finally, I think it's not necessary. Given a modicum of grace and imagination, thinking Christians today may prepare themselves to see precisely in our disestablishment not an impersonal, impersonal and inglorious destiny, such as may be the fate of institutions, but the will and providence of God. Our Protestant traditions of theology insist that God is at work in history, 
and that the divine spirit creates, recreates, judges and renews the body of Christ. What's happening to the churches in Europe and in North America today cannot therefore but be received by Christians as if it were totally devoid of purpose. The hand of God is in the humiliation of Christendom and the greatest humiliation of the church is its refusal to be humiliated. Our Protestant traditions of theology also insist that God's hand reaches out, as it were, to the human counterpart, to the covenant partner. History, including the history of the church, when it is Christianly understood, should never be conceived as that which willy-nilly happens to human beings and societies. Even though Christians must reject the modern idea that humans are the autonomous makers of history, the covenantal basis of our faith places upon humankind a participatory responsibility, a participatory responsibility for the unfolding of what seem to be God's purposes in history. Christians understand themselves to be stewards of the mysteries of God. Accordingly, we are called to participate in this judgment which is beginning at the household of faith and to participate also in the reforming, the reforming of the household of faith. The Reformation teaching concerning the continuous reformation of the disciple community, semper reformanda, assumes that God permits and commands the church to be involved in its own self-assessment and change, and that when this does not occur, something of the very essence of the church has been forfeited. When, therefore, in the subheading of this second section of my lecture tonight, I affirm that the message of the divine spirit to the churches in Canada and the United States is disestablish yourselves. When I affirm this, I'm referring to just this kind of participation in divine providence, this kind of stewardship. I think that divine providence is offering us as churches another possibility, a new form, indeed a new life. But we may accept this gift of the new only as we relinquish the old to which we are so stubbornly clinging. We may reform ourselves according to the new only as we intentionally relinquish what belongs to our past or much of it. Such things as the comfortable relationships that we have enjoyed with governments and ruling classes, the continuous confirmation of accepted social values and mores by means of which we sustain those relationships with power, the espousal of charities which ease our guilty consciences whilst allowing us to maintain neutrality with respect to the social structures that make such charities necessary, the silent acceptance of racial, sexual, gender, and economic injustices, or their trivialization through tokenism, failure to probe the depths of human and creaturely pathos by confining sin to petty immorality or doctrinal refinements drawn from the past, and so on. There is still largely unexplored wisdom in the tradition of Jerusalem, which, were we to awaken ourselves to it, could enable the Christian church truly to engage our society at the heart of its crises. But we shall not even be awakened to that wisdom, so long as we are content to play the redundant role of official religious cult to the official society. The point is, However, that role is being snatched from us in any case. <clears throat>
And the perpetuation of such an image of ourselves is in consequence increasingly a pathetic one. If we simply wait for more and more of the alleged privileges of establishment to be taken away from us by societal forces over which we have no or little control, we shall not even save for the future what was good in the Christendom past. If, on the other hand, we learn how to disengage ourselves, if with courage and trust we release our hold on what we have been conditioned to believe is something like our right or an immutable form of the church, if, to use a newer testamental image, we lose our life, ecclesiastically speaking, then we may, in fact, gain our life as Christ's living body. At this juncture in our sojourn, intentionality is the key to the future that these old ecclesiastical structures of ours may have. Intentionality is the key. That leads to my third point, disengagement as a work of theology. Having uh, Establish the necessary background thought, I shall now seek to demonstrate the thesis that, in my view, must be seriously contemplated by all who remain in the once mainline churches of these nations. That thesis could be stated as follows. Intentional disengagement from the dominant culture with which, in the past, the older Protestant denominations of this continent have been bound up is the necessary precondition for a meaningful re-engagement of our society, more, partic more particularly of that same dominant culture. I shall read it again. Intentional disengagement from the dominant culture with which in the past older Protestant denominations of this continent have been bound up is the necessary precondition for a meaningful re-engagement of our society, more particularly of that same dominant culture. Now, the demonstration of that thesis requires three steps. First, I must clarify what is entailed, in my view, in the idea of an intentional disengagement from the dominant culture. Second, I must explain, in a general way at least, how such a disengagement could facilitate meaningful re-engagement of that same culture. And third, I must provide enough concrete examples of such a process to give this whole idea contextual credibility. These tasks, tasks these three tasks will re require what remains of this evening's lecture and the fourth and final lecture tomorrow evening. First then, what is entailed in an intentional disengagement from the dominant culture? It's one thing to respond to such a question in societies such as most European societies have been where Christian establishments are of the legal de jure variety. It's something else in our context, in our North American context, where, as I argued in last evening's lecture, what obtains is not a legal establishment, but a cultural establishment. Just because ours is an establishment at the level of content rather than at the level of form, just because our close ties with the dominant culture have existed at the level of fundamental beliefs and lifestyles the rudiment, uh, and rudimentary moral assumptions. Any effective extrication of ourselves from this by now severely limiting relationship has to occur at that more subtle level, that is to say, at the level of thought. To put it quite clearly, for North American Christians who are serious about reforming the church so that it may become a more faithful bearer of gospel in our social context,
There is no alternative to a disciplined, prolonged, and above all, critical work of theology. And by theology, I do not mean, please, merely academic theology. I mean a theology that reaches into the life of congregations. Theology that asks of every Christian something of what it asks of those who pursue theology as a life work or calling. In short, by theology, I mean what Martin Luther had in mind when he wrote, Vivendo, imo, moriendo, et damnando, fit theologus, non intelligendo, legendo, aut speculando. It is by living, nay, rather by dying and being damned, that a theologian is made, not merely by understanding and reading and speculating. I'm talking about an existential process that in reaching into the congregation's life, causes a ferment of thought to occur. Concretely speaking, Christians must learn how to distinguish the Christian message from the operative assumptions, values, and pursuits of our host culture, and more particularly, those segments of our society with which, as so-called mainstream churches, we have heretofore been identified. Since most of the denominations in a question are bound up with middle class, Caucasian, and broadly liberal elements of our society, what we shall have to learn is that the Christian message is not just a stained glass version of the worldview of, of the social stratum with which we have made our bed. Now that's of course easily said, in these days it's even said rather frequently, but I'm not convinced that it's been grasped by more than a small percentage of Protestant clergy and laity. Moreover, the movements in our midst which have taken seriously the need for Christians in North America to distance themselves from the worldview of their conventional socio-economic constituency seems to me to err often in two fundamental ways. First of all, some of these voices that want us to clear, uh, to get away from our relationship with middle class uh, uh, dominant cultures, some of these voices convey the impression that such distancing is the very goal for which the church ought to strive and not just a means to what I called a moment ago our authentic re-engagement of that same society. They give many indications, do these voices, of disliking the middle class social stratum and everything that it stands for. They often seem to assume that first world, white, middle class societies are by definition irredeemable. That they are driven by an irreversible logic of oppression, injustice, and racial exclusivity. They tell us in one way or another that our only salvation as Christians is to dissociate ourselves from our waspish past or whatever is the equivalent in Germanic, Scandinavian and other terms and to align ourselves instead with those whom we oppress. One can understand the peculiar vehemence of such persons, especially the, those amongst them who know profoundly the plight of the victims that our dominant society has created, but the abandonment of the oppressor, the abandonment of the oppressor is no very likely way of effecting change. Besides, as Wendy Farley, a young theologian in Emory University in Atlanta, has aptly stated for those adopting this approach, and I quote, sensitivity to injustice and suffering often becomes a new dualism that categorizes human beings according to membership in the group of the oppressed or the oppressor. And she continues, I'm not convinced that this objectification of humanity into victim and executioner does justice to the complexity of the human individual 
or to the dynamic of evil. The web that unites victim and tyrant in the same person is more complex than the white hat, black hat caricature that seems banal even in its natural habitat, the grade B movie, end of quote. The second uh, questionable way in which minorities in the once mainline churches try to reform the churches is by identifying true Christianity with the adoption of what are perceived as radical positions on various contemporary issues of personal and social ethics. They insist that Christianity means advocating economic reforms aimed at greater global justice or full-scale disarmament or the preservation of species or gender equality or racial integration and so forth and so forth. Now I am entirely in agreement with the ethical conclusions that are suggested in those phrases. But I want to point out that they are conclusions. They are not points of departure. Perhaps the presentation of a radical ethic of economic justice, for example, can be a catalyst sometimes for genuine Christian evangelism. But on the whole, it seems to me, profoundly altered moral attitudes and specific ethical decisions are consequences of hearing gospel. Profoundly altered moral attitudes are consequences of hearing the gospel. When they are presented as if they were immediately accessible to everyone as categorical imperatives, to use the Kantian term, <coughs> gospel and law are being badly confused. The recent publication, A Social and Cultural History of Christianity, to which I made reference a moment ago, draws attention to one of the unfortunate consequences of this confusion within contemporary Protestant churches. I quote, the difficulties of the older Protestant denominations may stem from their willingness to embrace ideas and trends as defined by the nation's media and educational elites, elites that are remarkably unrepresentative of the religion, politics, and values of the nation's population. I'm strongly of the opinion that the Christian message erases all distinctions of worth and status between the races and the sexes. But it is the hearing of gospel that achieves this leveling. And if instead of gospel, what is proclaimed in the churches is nothing more than the kinds of musts and shoulds and ought tos that one can hear from many other quarters of human society today, then we can't expect church folk to be any more receptive to such exhortations than are their counterparts in society at large. The point is, the great changes that need to be effected in our churches are not, first of all, changes of behavior, but changes of understanding and of will. If the thinking of the churches is altered, then we may expect changes in the realm of attitudes and deeds as well. If, on the other hand, being Christian continues to mean little more than being predictable middle-class liberals with a tinge of something that is now fashionably called spirituality, then the few exceptional things that congregations occasionally manage to perform ethically will lack any foundation in repentance and faith and they will show up precisely as exceptions, ad hoc ethical non sequiturs, kept going by the enthusiasm of a few and the guilt of a somewhat larger cross-section of churchgoers. What I'm saying, what I'm seeking to establish by criticizing these two positions is that insofar as we're committed to genuine renewal in the churches that we represent, there are no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts. We must begin with basics. 
We have now two or three generations of people in and around the churches who are most of them not only unfamiliar with the, with the fundamental teachings of Christian tradition, but are ignorant also even of the scriptures. Some denominations have been more diligent than others in areas of Christian education, but I doubt that any North American Protestant denomination stemming from the central streams of the Reformation of the 16th century could measure up to the minimal standards of catechesis assumed by the reformers of the 16th century. I think if some of the reformers came in and catechized us, they would be astonished at our amnesia. <laughs> we even have to ask ourselves whether we have a well-educated professional clergy or at least a ministry whose basic theological education is continuously renewed and supplemented and then incorporated into preaching and congregational leadership. I think that we have been sold short in ministry by people who thought that ministers ought to be pastoral managers, entrepreneurs of the congregations rather than teaching elders. Without a deeping, deeper understanding, a deeper understanding of what Christians believe, it's absurd to think that ordinary church folk will be able to distinguish what is true to the Judeo-Christian tradition from the amalgam of religious sentimentalism and bourgeois transcendence by which both church and culture are saturated until a far greater number of church-going Americans and Canadians have become more articulate about the faith than they currently are, we cannot expect the churches to stand back from their sociological moorings far enough to detach what Christians profess from the mishmash of modernism, secularism, pietism, and free enterprise democracy with which Christianity in our context is so fantastically interwoven. But that uh, such a right dividing of the world of word of truth is what we shall have to aim for is borne out by recent sociological studies as well as theological ecclesiastical investigations. In their 1987 work entitled American Mainline Religion its changing shape and future. The sociologists Wade Clark Roof and William McKinney write, and I quote, if a revived public church is indeed on the horizon, moderate Protestantism will play a key role in bringing it into being. This will require forms and qualities of leadership that have seldom been forthcoming from the Protestant middle. A revitalized ecumenicity and new, bold theological affirmations are critical, especially a theology that resonates with and gives meaning to the experience of middle Americans." End of quote. Disengagement from our status of cultural establishment is primarily then a work of theology. And while that certainly constitutes work, because contemporary Protestants as a whole have not given prolonged thought to the faith, it, it is also a necessity that is felt by significant minorities within all of the denominations concerned. Instead of catering so exclusively to what are usually described as pastoral needs, though the term often cloaks institutional busy work, <laughs> ministers today are recalled to the teaching office. If the minister of the congregation is not herself or himself in some genuine sense a theologian, then we cannot expect laypersons to adopt some measure of the sort of informed thoughtfulness that is needed 
if as churches we are to find our way into the future. To conclude this present lecture, the opportunity that comes to serious Christians at the very point where Christianity seems to be in decline is an opportunity that has seldom presented itself in Christian history. Namely, the opportunity actually to become salt, yeast, and light that Jesus in the New Testament speaks of as the very character of the disciple community. To grasp this opportunity, however, we are going to have to relinquish our centuries-old ambition to be the official religion, to be the dominant religion, to be the powerful religion of our society. Ideationally, we must disengage ourselves from our society if we are going to re-engage our society at the level of truth and justice and love. In the final lecture, I'm going to take up this theme of disengaging in order to re-engage. And in this way, I shall hope to make concrete the proposals of these, the proposal of these lectures, namely, that after Christendom, the Christian movement may get on with being what all along it has been called to be, the cruciform body of Jesus Christ, a priestly and prophetic community of the way. Thank you. Well, I, I was a little confused about one thing this evening. There were moments I was certain.